Good, okay. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Oscar Marin, from King's College London. Um, I've known Oscar, well, certainly I've known Oscar's work for a number of years, but it was recently when we worked together on the MRC Neurosciences and Mental Health Board that I learned how knowledgeable and, you know, what a highly respected neuroscientist that, that Oscar is. So Oscar is a professor of neuroscience at King's College London. Uh, he directs the MRC Centre for Neurodevelopmental Disorder, Disorders. He also directs the Centre for Developmental Neurobiology at King's College London. So after graduating with a BSc in Biology and a PhD in Neuroscience in Madrid, uh, Oscar moved to UC San Francisco for, I think it was one year, it was five years, that's yeah. right, five years, and then to Spain, Alicante, as a group leader, before joining King's College about a decade ago. And from there has become a very established group leader, uh, won numerous prizes, I'm afraid I can't list them all, but there's some including the uh, Cajal Medal, Spanish uh, Royal Society, uh, the ECNP Neuropsychopharmacology Award last year, Ben's EJN Award uh, this year, and Oscar is particularly known for his discoveries concerning the development of the cerebral cortex, and particularly uh, inhibitory interneurons. I guess that's what we're going to hear about today, but if you look at Oscar's work, you'll realise that he's been incredibly important in how we understand neurodevelopmental disorders, for example, autism and schizophrenia. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Oscar to present his talk, which you can see the title there. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I, do you want? Do you need me to wear a microphone, or just hit my side? Am I actually help? I guess. Is that better? Um, oh, it's for recording, fantastic. Well, thank you, Jeff, for the introduction and thanks a lot for the invitation to come here. It's really a pleasure to um, visit. It's my first time uh, in this uh, department and I'm been very happy to talk to you know, many of you already uh, today. Um, as Jeff mentioned, I'm very interested in the cerebral cortex and how it develops, and, and primarily on GABAergic cells. So I'll tell you a couple of um, still unpublished stories that uh, uh, I selected today to give you a little bit of a flavor of some of the work um, that we do. As I said, you know, we are you know, interested in this structure that covers you know, most of our brain, the cerebral cortex, and obviously we are interested in how it's organized and developed in humans, although most of the time we use animal models like the mice to try to understand how it comes about. And we are interested in, you know, I think this is a bit relevant in this department because the cerebral cortex is, is one key structure that allows us to do many of the things that we do as, as uh, uh, humans, not only uh, controls our ability to perceive the world and to, you know, at least initially encode very complicated motor patterns, um, but I guess more importantly, it allows us to plan, to execute plans that we have predicted to um, um, uh, foresee in the future and adapt to our uh, immediate environment um, in a kind of reflective way, which is something that probably only primates uh, like us uh, has the ability to do. Now, the other side of, of uh, my interest in the cerebral cortex is because it's well known and I think it's increasingly um, uh, well known that uh, problems in the development of cerebral cortex is also linked to many neurological and psychiatric conditions that emerge early in life and even um, underlie you know, some conditions that, that you know, clinically we only recognize in you know, late uh, teenage years like psychosis and you know, schizophrenia, for example, in particular. We know um, we have very good evidences that um, the way that our brain or cortex is wired um, has something to do with the emergence of many of the symptoms that we see in these um, conditions. Um, so it's a fascinating problem to understand why we're human, you know, how we behave, what we behave, and also 
um, you know, how normal um, an abnormal development of the cerebral cortex leads to very different um, behaviors. Now, again, you know, in this audience, probably don't need to remind you this, but the cerebral cortex is organized, you know, it's you know, composed around two main classes of uh, neurons. Um, principal cells, also you know, known most of them as pyramidal cells, they use glutamate as main neurotransmitter. They are typically depolarizing uh, in the uh, adult uh, brain, therefore, you know, excitatory, if you want. Um, they have this very characteristic morphology, pyramidal shape uh, in, the, uh, in the cell soma. And they actually make the majority of the neurons in the cortex. They make most of the connections of the cortex too. They connect within a layer, across layers in a cortical column. They connect different areas in the cortex. They even send projections down to um, you know, structures in the uh, um, uh, telencephalon, like the basal ganglia, and they send actions all the way to targets as far as in the spinal uh, uh, core. Now, the other uh, class of neurons in the cortex are called interneurons or local circuit neurons, and they typically are inhibitory or you know hyperpolarizing or shunting in the uh, in the adult brain. They use GABA as main neurotransmitter, as all of you know, and they come in a much more you know much larger diversity of morphological types. Um, and you know, main feature is that in contrast to pyramidal cells, they specialize in controlling you know so to speak, and the lo local circuits. They are mostly interested in um, immediate vicinity, although there are sand gabaergic cells in the cortex that also form long-range long projections. But the majority, you know, specialize in making these um, long, uh, sorry, short um, kind of local um, uh, connections. And, you know, one way that you could uh, think about the way um, uh, these two populations of neurons work, and, you know, uh, this is a bit cheesy, but, you know, one good uh, metaphor about how the cortex, I think, that it works. If you can think of as, as, uh, the cortex as an orchestra to some extent in which pyramidal cells, excitatory cells, are the musicians, are the ones that carry the information, they are actually the ones that produce um, the music, and they also come in different flavors. Um, and interneurons somehow are the conductors of, of this orchestra. Obviously, there's not only one. There are many of them. I'll talk about that uh, uh, a bit later. But they specialize essentially in synchronizing and timing, gating the pace of, uh, of uh, uh, fighting for pyramidal cells. So they get actually, um, you know, very similar to what the conductor in the orchestra said, you know, can essentially pace um, and make sure that all instruments, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, compose a symphony by synchronizing the different sounds um, uh, of them. Now, uh, the lab, you know, over the last 20 years or so has specialized mostly in working around this population of GABA cells and try to understand how they develop, how they come about, how they integrate and function in the cerebral cortex. And, you know, we essentially have, you know, four um, key questions uh, regarding these cells. We spend a lot of time uh, working around the generation of diversity of GABA interneurons. For those that are uh, aficionados in the field, they, you know, you will know that there is not just one GABAergic cell type, but there are probably 30, 40, maybe 60 different types of GABAergic interneurons in the cerebral cortex. Each of them specialize in, you know, controlling a particular layer of the cortex and contacting with a particular subcellular compartment, particular set of uh, pyramidal cells. So there is a great diversity of inhibitory motifs, and we've been very interested in understanding how during development this diversity of cell types uh, emerge. Uh, over the last few years, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, we've become um, almost obsessed about understanding what determines the final numbers of GABA cells in the cortex. And, you know, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, what we think this is important. Um, a lot of our work also has to do with understanding the rules that control the widening, the connectivity of these uh, interneurons, how they form synaptic connections, how they choose a specific partners, even a specific subcellular locations for their synapses. And a lot of this work is actually related to developmental disorders because we now, for example, that many of the genes are mutated in many of these conditions um, encode for proteins that are important uh, for synaptic specificity or synaptic uh, function. And then finally, and this has always been um, kind of a rare uh, uh, oddity in the lab, there's always a few uh, people in the lab working in the adult uh, uh, cortex and, and primarily involved in looking at um, neuroplasticity for GABAergic interneurons in the cortex, which is a way to think about 
so to speak, you know, developmental mechanisms that are recycled um, in the adult and that used, uh, uh, are used by interneurons to, to contribute to cortical functioning. Um, uh, so today I'm going to be uh, doing an exercise that is uh, atypical. I'm going to go very, very far away from my normal talk about uh, GABAergic uh, brain development. And I'm going to dare to tell about things that I understand a lot less. Uh, and, and I'll be very happy uh, to get your feedback um, uh, on this. Um, as I said, I'm going to dare to talk about behavioral experiments, which you know, I think this is the perfect uh, context to receive uh, uh, good feedback. Um, and then I'll tell you, you know, in the second part of my talk, I'll, I'll talk about a little bit uh, plasticity in cortical um, uh, interneurons uh, from a physiological and molecular uh, point of view. And I, I hope um, that this will give you at least a sense of some of our uh, recent uh, uh, work. Now, these two topics that seem slightly um, disentangled, they all revolve around a very kind of simple and prevalent concept in the literature. And, and if you go on Google for EI balance, or if you do EI balance and psychiatric conditions or cortical functioning, you will see a lot of entries. Because it is immediately appealing, you know, you go back to the idea of the orchestra, it's immediately appealing that, you know, this relationship between pyramidal cells and interneurons is very, you know, interlinked. And, you know, one of the elements fail, then the whole system probably uh, will crumble. If, if your musicians are not working well, the symphony will not uh, work properly, but also if your conductors are not doing the job, then the music will not be played in the right, um, uh, in the right way. Um, now, when you talk about EI balance, uh, then you, know, you, you ask 100 people, you may have actually 100 different responses. So people think about this in very different ways. Um, today, I'm going to tell you about EI balance from two very different perspectives. I'm going to tell you first um, uh, some work we've been doing about uh, how the actual ratio of excitatory and inhibitory cells, so numbers of cells, are, is controlled, and, and why this might actually be important, and you know, why the numbers are uh, uh, precisely established during development. And in the second part, I will take a you know, more conventional uh, take on EI balance, and I will discuss, you know, from a very cellular perspective, what it means for a cell to receive more or less excitation, more or less inhibition, and how they actually cope with changes in activity um, in uh, behaving animals. Right, so let me start with the uh, uh, first question, and that actually revolves around a very, very uh, uh, interesting, you know, observation, if you want. And in mammals, if, if you look across the entire scale of, you know, mammals, um, you know, brains of very, very different sizes, as, as simplified in this um, slide, you will see that the ratio of excitatory inhibitory cells is highly conserved. And, and what you can see, you know, monkey, uh, you know, primates, not human primates, and, and humans are very similar in that sense. And what you can see is that um, there, there are now more interneurons per um, excitatory cell. So this is five excitatory cells for every interneuron in the mouse. In humans, you know, there's a, there's a bit more interneurons, but generally speaking, for brains that are, you know, dramatically different in size, um, evolution has maintained this ratio between excitatory and inhibitory cells in a fairly narrow range, and that probably has an important meaning. There must be, you know, some formula, some factor that, that optimizes this um, ratio. And over the last few years, one of the things that we have learned is that one of the processes, not the only one, but one of the processes that determine the final number of, of uh, cells in the cortex, the, the final number of, of neurons in the cortex, is a, pro, a process called programmed cell death that you know, has been very well studied in many regions of the brain, but not so much uh, uh, in the cortex. And this actually worked from two postdocs in the lab, from one and Kinga, that a number of years ago we started looking at this, you know, with kind of uh, you know, from a cellular perspective, trying to understand how both pyramidal cell numbers and interneuron numbers are adjusted during development. And what you can see in this graph, and this is work in the mouse, uh, is that you know if you take the refer as a reference the number of neurons in the cortex at birth, uh, which is around here, and you take these as your zero level, what you see is that there are two waves of um, programmed cell death. The first wave um, that deals with excitatory cells, which are here in green, that in the mouse, you know, happens between P2 and P5. So in a, in a small window of about three days, 
the brain uh, you know, corrects and removes about 10-12% of the uh, excitatory neurons through this process of programmed cell death. And that's followed by a slightly longer window immediately after the correction of the numbers of excitatory cells um, that actually is much more profound and may actually get rid of about 30% of the interneurons that the brain has to spend energy in making, taking to the cortex, and then distributing through it. And then in the course of about five days, about a third of you know, those interneurons um, are killed. Um, now, what this suggests is that these two processes are con you know, concatenated and may actually be physiologically uh, related to one another. And we did a number of experiments, which I'm not going to show you details, so you're going to summarize in this slide, that suggests that these windows of programmed cell death are very important to you know, uh, establish the final uh, ratio of uh, excitatory inhibitory cells. And you can do experiments uh, within the window of uh, programmed cell death for GABA interneurons in which you modify the activity of pyramidal cells. So you don't affect, in a cell thermos uh, way, uh, interneurons, but you play with the activity of pyramidal cells during the window of uh, programmed cell death of interneurons. And what you see is that if you do experiments, you know, chemogenetic experiments, for example, and you increase the activity of pyramidal cells in that window of time, you end up with a cortex that has many more interneurons that uh, under normal circumstances. Uh, if you do the opposite, if you do uh, decrease the activity of pyramidal cells or you prevent glutamatergic signaling, for example, during that specific window of time, then you end up with uh, a cortex that has many less, fewer interneurons than they normally um, have. Um, so during that period, um, somehow interneurons can be fine-tuned by you know, the cells that are you know, making most of the connections that they receive, which are pyramidal cells. And they will adjust their final numbers only within this window of time uh, to the activity and, and number of uh, interneurons. If you do any of these manipulations beyond that window, you will probably modify you know, synaptic plasticity, connections, and, and many other things, but you no longer impact the final number of interneurons. So there is a very critical window in which you know, the final number of neurons in the cortex is established. I just want to show you, um, you know, an image of a representative experiment. So here, what we did is use genetics to um, get rid of, remove um, glutamatergic transporters that are used in pyramidal cells to load the vesicles with glutamate. So in these um, mice, in that region of the cortex, we injected this um, uh, Cree virus. Uh, pyramidal cells are not able to load glutamate uh, into the vesicles, so they could fire, but they will release blanks, so to speak. They will not release glutamate. And if you do this at the right you know, window of time, the, when you look at the adult cortex, this uh, cortex has you know, many, many fewer uh, GABAergic uh, interneurons. And you, know, you can do a reverse experiment, and you will get, you know, if you increase the activity of these cells, you will get many more GABAergic uh, cells. Now you can do an even more radical uh, manipulation, and I told you that you know you have these two windows of programmed cell death, pyramidal cells and interneurons. So you can do that's the beauty of uh, uh, mouse genetics. You can do an experiment in which you can altogether prevent pyramidal cells from dying. You can rescue them from programmed cell death because we know the roots, the molecular roots, the signaling pathway that is used for these cells to undergo apoptosis. So you can do genetics, remove two genes, back and back, that are critical uh, for programmed cell death. And then you can create a mouse that has approximately 10, 12% more pyramidal cells that, that normally will have. And in these mice, what you see is that they also uh, uh, end up with, with having more GABAergic interneurons. So this window is, you know, is critical to adjust the final number of GABAergic cells to the activity and numbers of pyramidal cells. And how given the, the, the brain in this window of time, the plasticity, the cellular plasticity to adjust final numbers to you know, the number of musicians, if you want, that you have uh, in the cerebral cortex. Now, this is uh, uh, shown in this data. You know, this, uh, this is complicated genetics that you don't need to, uh, to understand. But what you do in, in these mice, what you see is that there is no longer a drop in the number of pyramidal cells. And then when you look in a non-cell autonomous way, is this the cortex of these mice, and this is just looking at one population of interneurons, have these 30% more uh, GABAergic cells uh, uh, in the cortex. Now, the one thing that uh, uh, has become more intriguing uh, over the last few years since we uh, uh, published this work 
is that this process of programmed cell death is actually very heterogeneous across the entire cortex. It's not just, you know, a, a tabula rasa for uh, all of them. So you correct in about 30% or an average across the entire cortex. Um, but as you can see, and, and this is this is actually uh, need to replace this. It's a bit old um, uh, a slide. Um, but Ellie, another postdoc in the lab, has gone through uh, the very painful job of quantifying interneurons across uh, all cortical areas in, in the cortex. And this is just to show uh, heterogeneity in, you know, in one snapshot of, of program cell death for, the, uh, uh, for these interneurons. So we now think that you know, uh, across the entire cortex, almost every cortical area is select to some extent the final complement of interneurons and tailors that complement of interneurons to the cyto architecture of pyramidal cells that are present in, in that particular um, uh, area. Now, that also, you know, because we have these experiments in which we can prevent the uh, cell death of pyramidal cells, that also, and, you know, and this heterogeneity have given us a, a tool in which we can begin to explore the idea of, well, this is fantastic. It kind of makes a lot of sense that these two things go hand in hand, that you define final numbers of inhibitory cells to the number and activity of pyramidal cells in early development. But, you know, does this actually have any functional consequences? or the brain has the capacity to eventually use, I don't know, synaptic plasticity and other um, uh, mechanisms to adapt to these changes in uh, cell numbers. Uh, so this, uh, because of the heterogeneity of, of program cell death, uh, we have now generated mice uh, that are, you know, mutant for these back back factors that has a, a very different complement of uh, interneurons across different cortical areas. And, for example, you have no changes essentially in the visual cortex. I'm happy to discuss about that uh, later in the questions if you want, but uh, there is very little program cell death in the visual cortex. The visual cortex, uh, primary visual cortex, I, I would say, is an outlayer uh, compared to other cortical areas, and there is very little program cell death. So if you intervene and, and you, you um, uh, prevent program cell death, it, you know, very little happens in the visual cortex. But in the primary somatosensory the sensory cortex, in S1, uh, for example, there is you know, 10% more pyramidal cells and about 30% more interneurons than normal. And if you go all the way to the prefrontal cortex, uh, something quite interesting happened. Um, there is essentially no changes in pyramidal cells, so there is very little cell death there. Um, however, you know, interneurons in early stages get mostly inputs from other cortical areas. So in these mice, you also see an abnormal increase in the density of GABA or the interneurons. So we have mice that have a very, you know, heterogeneous pattern of uh, distributions. Uh, we have a lot more granular data than what I'm showing you here, and we can discuss about that, but, you know, I think maybe for the purpose of the talk, that's uh, sufficient. So a student in the lab, Risto, uh, 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 Jamul, and, and together with a postdoc, Barun, and with the help of uh, Adil uh, Han, set up some behavioral uh, uh, experiments to explore, you know, performance, behavioral performance in, in these uh, uh, mice. And you're probably all very familiar with this because uh, Jasper, together with Adil, developed uh, uh, a lot of these uh, experiments that, that we just piggyback uh, uh, since the arrival of uh, Adil to the, uh, uh, to the center. But we want to essentially have a fairly controlled behavioral task that we could actually use across sensory modalities to explore whether these changes in the ratio of excitatory cells and inhibitory cells will impact um, behavior. And this is a go-no-go -no -go task. Uh, um, and again, not going into uh, any of the details, but the animal is rewarded uh, when, when it recognizes the uh, um, right uh, go stimulus, and it, you know, it serves a timeout when, when it doesn't, um, and it leaks in the wrong place, and it's at head-fixed uh, uh, mice. And uh, we did this experiment at head-fixed mice because eventually we wanted to do either imaging or electrophysiology, and, and sure that you have seen this uh, uh, previously from uh, Jasper. Um, but the mice, you know, over the course of a week or so, for example, in these uh, visual discrimination tasks get really good at, at uh, discriminating between the uh, two different stimulus. Um, and you, you train the animal with a relatively uh, easy task of separating two um, gradients that are very different. And as I said, the animals actually get to learn this quite quickly uh, in the process of a week. And to some extent, this is a good control experiment because, as I told you, uh, in these mice, the only thing we have done initially, I mean, they're I'm sure very cascading, right? but initially the only thing we have done is to change the ratios of GABAergic and uh, pyramidal cells. But the visual cortex in particular 
we haven't actually done anything. There is very, very little uh, difference, uh, non-significant differences in the uh, numbers and ratios of these subs. Now, when you look at uh, how these animals learn, uh, there is essentially no difference whatsoever between control and mutant mice. And, and you know, this is you know a graph to show this. This is uh, training systems and days. Uh, it takes about a week for them to learn. This index measure how well uh, the animals do the task. Zero is essentially chance uh, level, so they randomly pick one of the two ratings. And you know, when they go about you know this uh, uh, D prime two. Um, they are really, you know, very good at doing uh, these tasks. As you can see, you know, the time they get, you know, that it takes for them to get to D prime between three and four days is it's identical for control and for mutant mice uh, in this particular uh, task. So no differences, uh, which kind of makes sense because there is no changes in the uh, visual cortex. Now the nice thing about this task is that we could now transfer essentially the same you know, game, the same uh, uh, sort of task. Um, but we designed it to, for the animal to do um, uh, sensory discrimination. Instead of using visual tasks, now they use the whisker, uh, the whiskers to sense uh, some papers of different grains. So they can discriminate between, you know, some paper with very crossed uh, uh, dots and, you know, very fine uh, grains. But the structure of the task is identical to what we have used for the uh, uh, for the visual task. So, you know, they are rewarded when they get the right uh, stimulus and they are unrewarded uh, otherwise. Now, in this case, um, uh, there is a, you know, major change in the proportion of, of uh, neurons in the cortex. There's about 10% more interneurons, uh, sorry, 10% more pyramidal cells through the entire somatosensory cortex, and there's about 30% more GABAergic cells uh, in the uh, barrel field of this uh, uh, cortex. And, you know, I haven't said that, but, you know, experiments from Jasper and Adil, and in this case, you know, from Hellman and others, uh, suggest that, you know, uh, in, the first in the first case, the B1 is, is, is immediately required for the animals to be able to learn this task. And in the case of these uh, somatosensory uh, whisker-based tasks, you also need S1 uh, to perform uh, so it's not that these, you know, the animals have another way of, of doing this. But what you can see is that it may take a bit longer for them, about five days to, to learn the, uh, these tasks. It's a bit more difficult. But again, as you can see, control and mutant mice, no difference whatsoever uh, in their ability to learn this task. And in both cases, in the visual task and in the uh, whisker-raised uh, task, once the animals have learned, then you can do, you know, psychophysics experiments. You can actually have the animal tested and make the task a lot more difficult. You can actually make the gratings more similar, or in this case, you can make the grains, um, uh, the textures, look more similar. And there you can define psychophysic uh, curves, and the performance, again, between control and mutant mice is indistinguishable. So um, these mice do not have a problem in learning the task, and their you know, sense of discrimination index, if you want, their ability to discriminate between uh, 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 sensory inputs that are you know, identical is... Uh, not change between control um, and mutant mice. So at the very least, uh, uh, at this point, you know, uh, in, in, in no very rewarding way, we learned that you can actually modify the numbers of a cortical region in a very you know, profound way, not a subtle uh, way, in a very profound way. And the cortex will find a way to deal with it. And you know, at this, in, in the context of this particular task, um, be able to do uh, uh, the behavior learn the behavior without um, any major problem. And then Risto did a final set of experiments in which what he did is, is to do sequential uh, learning. So he trained animals first on the um, uh, sensory waistcoat dissimulation uh, task, and then when he finished with this paradigm, he then took the animals through a visual discrimination uh, uh, task. And what he observed, and, and this is you know, not a discovery, but you know, it's known uh, and it's quite nice that if you only look at you know, normal mice, controlled mice, um, and here I'm showing you performance on the visual discrimination task. What I'm comparing here is mice that uh, are naive uh, to learning, so they have only been taken through the visual discrimination task, versus mice that have learned first the whisker discrimination task, and then following that they are now exposed and learn the visual discrimination task. And what you see is that there is a shift towards the left of the learning curve uh, that suggests that the animals that have experience, that have learned the task on the whisker uh, discrimination task, 
now are much faster in learning um, uh, the, the baseball task than mice that uh, uh, you know are naive, uh, so to speak, uh, to the uh, task. And uh, this has been a study in primates a lot, and in humans in particular. Um, some people call this learning to learn, transfer of knowledge, transfer of learning, but essentially the idea, the, the concept, and you're much better placed to explain this concept to me, is that the animal is able to learn the general rule of the game in the first uh, training session, and in the second, um, um, you know, paradigm, you know, after in this case uh, a couple of uh, training sessions, the animal you know, begins to apply essentially the same uh, rules. Uh, and now, you know, realize that the task is the same. Now, the sensory input that is uh, defining the outcome is uh, different. Now, what is really interesting, at least from my perspective, is that the mutant mice, um, um, and you know, I guess that this, you know, I would say that. Uh, and maybe the disclaimers should come here. I'm not going to show you any mechanistic uh, experiment linking any particular brain secret to transfer learning, and that's something that it's you know not only we are not really deeply interested, but we are definitely not placed uh, uh, to solve. Um, but you know, uh, people in the field think that you know part of this uh, transfer learning, this learning to learn, requires prefrontal media prefrontal uh, function, and. You know, it's interesting in our context that our mutant mice have, you know, fairly uh, imbalanced uh, our numbers in the media prefrontal cortex. And obviously, I wouldn't be telling you uh, this story if it was not, you know, very dramatic that you know mutant mice now are unable to do transfer learning. And as you can see here, even though they are, they also been taken now through the whisker-based task. When they get to the visual discrimination task, they, they do learn at the same rate that the naive animals uh, will actually learn. And you can see you know, the difference in getting to the prime equal to uh, is substantially increased compared to uh, controlled mice. So the mice are able to learn each of these tasks indistinguishable from controlled mice, but they are not able to profit, so, uh, so to, uh, to speak, from having learned a task, you know, the week before in a different, uh, uh, um, you know, modality, sensory modality, and then apply kind of that rule to benefit to speed up learning in the uh, uh, in the second task. So that tells you that not, you know they might be very good at you know um, dealing with changes in cell numbers for some particular behaviors, but maybe if you push, you keep you know looking um, um, a bit deeper in this. Case and you know a slightly more cognitive demanding task, uh, then you start seeing that you know not having the right proportion of cells might actually be not uh, that great. But as I said, you know in my disclaimer, I'm not going to show you any mechanistic uh, uh, evidence suggesting or linking um, uh, you know uh, this problem to a particular brain secret. But the one thing that we really want to see is that if this is all downstream of changing the number of interneurons in the cortex, in this case perhaps in the prefrontal cortex, uh, because that area has been involved in transfer learning, at the very least we will want to see a signature um, in the brain that neurons are coding information in a different way, even if we cannot you know, mechanistically link you know, that change to the behavioral change that I saw you um, a minute ago. Um, so for that purpose, what we did is to look into this window, you know, um, you know, second to fourth day, when you see the divergence in, in the learning rates between control and mutant mice, and while the animals are learning the task, record from the medial prefrontal cortex. And what we did essentially is, is to isolate units and to um, uh, um, segregate them, or, or if you want, group them based on their ability to code for... Um, um, you know, the go uh, that rewarded, so to speak, um, uh, a stimulus, or the no-go rewarded uh, a stimulus. And you know, I'm going to show you two pieces of evidence suggesting that, indeed, the brain is now encoding information in a different way. The first one is that in control mice, and this has been described in other paradigms, um, as the animal learns, the proportion of cells in the medial prefrontal cortex encoding for either go or, or no-go selective cells um, increase uh, quite a bit in this window. And in Mutant mice, we don't see um, uh, this increase. So you, know, you, you seem to have a more, you know, flatter um, uh, uh, distributions of uh, neurons uh, encoding go and no uh, go selective uh, uh, units. And the second is that the dynamics in the way that information is encoded is also different between uh, individual uh, neurons. And I'm going to show you a couple of examples of that. Um, so you can classify essentially the neurons in, you know. 
being go selective or no go selective by their you know by their firing um, uh, rates. And as you can see, for go selective um, uh, units in orange is their you know firing in response to go stimulus, and in blue is their firing in response to no go stimulus. And as you can see here, there's no difference in the way these go selective units are encoding information. They will fire to both the go and the no go stimulus but they will fire more to go selective than no go selective um, uh, uh, stimulus. What is really interesting is that for the no go uh, stimulus, uh, the no go selective units, um, the majority of the units uh, that encode for no go stimulus in, in the control animals have this shape. And what you see is that they are no go selective because they still fire more for the no go stimulus than the go stimulus. But essentially, what you see is that most of these units actually suppress firing and the presentation of this, um, um, in this case, visual stimulus. Um, but in the mutant, as you can see here, that you know, the units that encode for no go selective cells, and, you know, they really have a very different profile. They actually fire on the presentation of the no go uh, stimulus. So, in a very kind of simplistic and you know, completely uh, 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 probably not true way of looking at this, if you think of these cells as premotor uh, units, you would imagine that these cells will allow you know, firing uh, on the presentation of no-go stimulus, and in controls, these cells will suppress fire with, with, you know, when the, the no-go selective um, or the no-go stimulus is presented. But in the mutants, you know, um, you know, there's essentially no difference in the firing of these units for go and no-go uh, selective cells. So at the very least, I hope I, I convince you that changing you know, the proportion of cells lead to changes, you know, changes in the way that cells are connected um, and the way that the wiring of the uh, cortex is done in this particular uh, region uh, that leads to at least very clear, very dramatic differences in the way information is encoded in this uh, particular region. Right, so let me finish the, uh, this um, uh, part with you know, two take-home messages. The first one, you know, developmental side of it, it's very clear that the cortex has evolved a way to um, control the ratio, the proportion of these two cell types uh, uh, during early development, and that happens in a very particular window in uh, uh, mice. Uh, we are currently exploring whether we can find this window in primates, including humans. Uh, I can discuss about what we're doing for that uh, later on, but it's not a trivial uh, exercise. And the second, as I said, you know, uh, what I can uh, at least conclude from these experiments is that the cortex can accumulate, can accommodate for a good number of changes, important changes, um, and eventually output a behavior that is indistinguishable to control mice. But that for some tasks, in this particular case, kind of this transfer learning paradigm, uh, you can really uh, see that you know the changes uh, uh, that you introduce impact the way information is encoded in the uh, in the cortex. Again, I'm happy to discuss more about that uh, later. You know, one thing that is quite surprising is that basal firing rates are identical in the medial prefrontal cortex for both control and mutant mice. So they actually manage to normalize, you know, uh, basal firing without any problem. Yet, you know, the way that uh, these cells are encoding information, it's very different. Right, let me change gears. Uh, quite a bit, maybe to a terrain and, uh, and a bit more familiar uh, with, but I'm going to continue with... Uh, um, you know, mostly electrophysiological uh, um, uh, work. Um, and as I tell you in the introduction, you know, I, I wanted to tell you something about EI balance from a cellular perspective, from, you know, population level perspective. I want to tell you now a story, you know, about EI balance from the perspective of single cells and how they actually cope with changes in, in activity. And the basic concept here, um, uh, you know, parallel to the ratios of interneurons and intercellular cells, uh, that I used to introduce um, on my first part of the talk is the idea that there is a population of GABAergic interneurons that you know, are identified through the rest of uh, the talk in red, and they are fast spiking interneurons. They use um, a calcium binding protein uh, called pardalbumin you know, as, as a buffer uh, of, uh, of calcium, and you can use that to identify these cells. These cells are, are very critical in controlling activity in the cortex because they make synapses in the soma of pyramidal cells, so they have very close control of the output of, of pyramidal cells. And uh, these populations serve, among other things, to you know, make sure to stabilize um, uh, the firing of, of pyramidal uh, cells. And one of the things that we have learned over you know, the last 10, 15 years or so is that they are able to equalize 
the uh, activity that the individual pyramidal cells encode. So in a very schematic way, if you have pyramidal cells that is you know, receiving a lot of excitation and is therefore very active, that cell will recruit an equivalent you know, um, uh, strong inhibition to make sure that you know, their firing you know, rates are more or less stabilized to that level of excitation. Whereas other pyramidal cells that may receive less excitation will recruit, again, um, an equivalent um, um, uh, smaller amount of inhibition to uh, sustain a more or less constant um, um, uh, rate uh, of, uh, of inhibition. Now, this uh, uh, process, obviously, not like depicted here in the, uh, uh, in the scheme, is actually quite dynamic, and it may actually change. And, and uh, what, what we know is that probably interneurons are able to adapt to those changes in, in activity. What we don't know is what probably uh, interneurons themselves do when uh, they actually receive you know, changes in excitation. So we know that they are able to help stabilizing the activity of pyramidal cells, but when they themselves receive more or less excitation, we don't know how they adapt to these uh, changes. And obviously, this is actually critical for sustaining you know, a balance of normal firing rates in, in a cortical network. And we also think that this is happening and it's very important. And this is, for example, work from uh, uh, Pico Caroni in Switzerland, in which they can see that animals that are learning um, different populations of probably in cells will change their activity rates over the period of, of learning. And um, this has not been done looking at, you know, electrophysiological properties, but you can use, for example, parallel booming levels as a proxy of the activity of the cells. And you can very nicely see that assemblies of cells involved in stabilizing a particular assemble of uh, neurons in, in learning will change uh, the levels of activity. So a postdoc in the lab, uh, Martin, uh, designed a, a relatively simple experiment to have a very close control of the activity of a very small number of parallel booming interneurons, and then ask the question, you know, if you change the activity of, that any of these cells receive, how do the cell, how the fast spiking interneuron respond to these changes in activity? Now, the experiment is relatively uh, straightforward. Um, we actually inject these viruses uh, quite early for practical purposes, but uh, these are threats, so we are going to um, either activate or uh, inhibit, or if you want better, maybe better phrase, we're going to increase the excitability or decrease the excitability of, of these power booming interneurons in a genetically controlled way, but we are going to do this in the adults. So even though we do this very early, we only inject them with vehicle or CNO, so the agonists of the threat receptors, um, in animals that are you know, typically 8 or, or 10 uh, uh, weeks uh, old. And what we're going to do is, you know, for a couple of days, we're going to increase the excitability of the cells, and then we're going to ask, you know, how they have uh, adapted to these uh, changes. So after this, um, uh, Martin will do, you know, patch. We'll get slices, and we'll patch these cells, and we'll ask, you know, uh, how they have adapted to uh, the changes. Now, the key of these experiments, uh, for any of you that have worked with, with uh, uh, fast spiking interneurons, is that they are so potent in changing, you know, the activity of pyramidal cells, is that very similar to epigenetic experiments, if you change the whole population of parvovian cells, you immediately silence the entire cortex, and then you elicit a lot of non-cell autonomous network changes that will be difficult to disentangle for what individual cells are doing. So the key to these experiments is to titer your virus to inject and to infect a very small um, proportion of uh, GABA interneurons. This is an example of how they induce, for example, false uh, within you know, uh, hours of the injection, and you can see this is very, very sparse uh, infection. So Martin uh, typically will infect maybe 20%, 25% of the GABAergic interneurons. And in all these experiments, you always have non-infected cells as control, so you can always look at uh, that you have not induced kind of network changes in uh, these experiments. And as I said, you know, he will then go and prepare slices and then you know, do parts clamp. And in these uh, uh, cells, do um, uh, whole cell recordings. And in this case, you know, um, he actually record miniature excitatory inhibitory um, uh, currents. As you can see, when you increase the activity of uh, PV cells, and then you go and record the, uh, the excitation that these cells receive, um, there is essentially no, virtually no change uh, either in the amplitude or the uh, um, frequency of uh, miniature excitatory events that these cells receive. Um, however, as you can see, there is a very dramatic change in the amount of inhibition that these um, uh, parvovian interneurons um, uh, receive. And you see, 
when you increase the activity of PV cells in, in a couple of days, you will see a, a massive increase or, or, or you know, significant increase in, in the amplitude and an even more important increase in the frequency of miniature inputs that uh, these uh, uh, cells receive. And this is not just a change in the strength of the kind of synaptic inputs that they receive. I'm not going to show you the data, but if you go and quantify the number of synapses, inhibitory synapses these cells receive, you will see um, the same equivalent uh, uh, change in the number of synapses. So um, the way that, that these cells uh, uh, adapt to having increased uh, excitation is not reducing the number of excitatory inputs they receive, but actually increasing or recruiting more inhibition to, uh, to themselves. And if you do the opposite experiment, I'm not going to show you this here, but if you decrease the activity of, of PV cells, the same happens. No changes in excitation, but the cells will get rid of inhibition. So they control their excitability by recruiting more or less inhibition to themselves. Um, now the question uh, here, oh, actually I have this uh, in here. So this is uh, what I was telling you, it's not just a strength uh, uh, of uh, uh, synapses, so it's not just a rapid change in the amount of receptors that you see in these cells, but as you can see, you, you, the, the cells actually end up making or receiving more synapses uh, uh, for another inhibitory, uh, inhibitory cells. So the question that, you know, uh, next question, I guess, that, that uh, Martin wanted to answer is where these inputs are coming from, where, you know, what other interneuron is actually providing this uh, uh, inhibition that the cells need to recruit to compensate for this increase in excitability. And kind of broadly speaking, um, they can get inputs from, you know, three major classes of interneurons. They can get inputs from other PB interneurons, um, and that has been reported, or from some other statin interneurons or VIP interneurons. Um, so Martin designed, again, relatively complicated genetic experiments, but the idea here is to be able to still very sparsely modify the excitability of, you know, isolated PB cells, and at the same time having access, optogenetic access, to each of these populations of interneurons in different uh, experiments. So, you know, again, not going to go through the details, but essentially what you're doing here in these experiments is you still have um, your dreads expressing only a very sparse population of, uh, of PV cells, while you're expressing channel adoption in either all the PV cells, all the somatostatin cells, or all the VIP cells. And what Martin found is that, you know, uh, obviously then you can do experiments, you can do full lab stimulation, and because you know that you expect an increase in inhibition coming from somewhere, then you can measure whether that increase comes from a particular population of interneurons, or you could also see an increase in all the populations. But what you can see quite nicely is that when you do these experiments and stimulate some other statin cells, you see no difference in these uh, 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 currents. Uh, when you do the same for BIP interneurons, you also see no differences in these currents. Now, quite nicely, when you do the experiment and you stimulate other PV cells, you see a fairly massive increase in inhibition. So that, you know, together with histological evidence, suggests that uh, this increased inhibition that, that fast spiking PV interneurons are recruiting to compensate for the increase in activation is actually coming from other PV cells uh, nearby that are providing more inhibitory inputs to these uh, cells. This is not totally unsurprising because you know, PV cells are known to make a lot of somatic synapses or pyramidal cells, but their second favorite target are other PV uh, uh, interneurons. Um, so they seem to be using these PV PV connections to compensate for uh, their own uh, activity. Right, because we are um, uh, deep down in a, a fairly molecular uh, lab, even though you may not believe it uh, uh, with the talk that I, I'm giving you at, uh, at this point. Um, we hypothesize that these changes in the amount of connectivity that PV cells uh, receive in response to changes, variations in their activity, might be mediated by changes in gene expression and by the encoding of a particular set of proteins that will control, um, you know, specifically, um, so to speak, the, the changes in synapses that uh, are reflected there. So, you know, the model is, you know, you increase activity, these cells simultaneously produce something that will signal to you know, nearby PV cells that they will need to increase their inputs. And that's happening in our hypothesis, perhaps through or involving gene expression. Um, so what we did is a series of experiments that, you know, uh, that are called um, trap experiments, or B-trap in this case, because it's a vital trap. Um, it's a relatively simple experiment, not easy to do, but it's a relatively simple experiment. Uh, again, 
Um, what, what you're doing here is essentially do the same manipulation uh, uh, that I was saying you before. So you want to modify the activity of these cells in a very sparse way over a couple of uh, days. And in the very same cells that you are modifying the, uh, uh, the activity, you are expressing now a construct, uh, um, you know, a gene that encodes for a modified ribosomal protein. And that ribosomal protein, in this case, is RPL10A, will have uh, a tag attached uh, uh, to it. So that when you do your experiments and you modify the activity of these cells, you know, you, then you can kill the animals and then you can isolate uh, these ribosomes with the tag that you put on it. And along with the ribosomes, you will pull down all the RNA that's been translated in those cells at that given time. And then you can just isolate the RNAs, do RNA sequencing, and you are essentially isolating RNAs that are being translated in the cells that are changing their activity over this uh, period of time. Now, that took a lot of optimizing, essentially because we, we are infecting so very few cells in, uh, in the cortex. And not only that, I mean, you could do this experiment just with pure genetics, but, you know, again, if some of you have used PV cream eyes, you will know that there is a population of layer 5 pyramidal cells that are also expressed. Um, uh, PV, and therefore it will recombine whatever you are putting into uh, into them. If you are just doing, you know, for example, uh, electrophysiological experiments in, in in slices, it's fine because you go to layer two, three, and you put your cells. There is no confusion. But if you need to isolate the cortex, you cannot simply rely on genetics uh, or this direct genetics, because you will also pull down RNAs from pyramidal cells, and then you will not be looking at what you are supposed to be looking. So Martin did um, something a bit more sophisticated again, and I'll show you the details, but using combinatorial genetics that you can exclude your pyramidal cells out of the uh, pool. And this is, you know, what the experiments look like. This is the actual number of cells that he could, you know, identify, you know, very, very precisely uh, in which you are changing uh, the activity. And then, you know, uh, we get, you know, cortices from I don't know how many mice uh, and then pull down RNA and, you know, look at the uh, gene changes. Now, when he did this experiment, um, the first thing that we found is very reassuring. And as expected, you know, uh, you would imagine that the process that happens in hours and, you know, uh, and, and, you know in this context, you know, in, in, in the process of a few hours to a couple of days, is that very early on you have uh, induction of uh, expression of a lot of, you know, these immediate early genes that are known to regulate many aspects of plasticity in the cells. And as you can see, these are over-induced uh, in the cells that are uh, changing their activity. Now, we have observed a number of many other changes. I'm going to focus today on telling you about two uh, particular genes because I think that this you know, uh, uh, is somehow some sort of new biology which we are really very interested in. So two of the genes that get induced immediately after the uh, immediate early genes are SCG2 and BGF. BGF is a non-acronymic. Uh, um, I can explain why they call it BGF, but it's essentially a, a close relative of SCG2. Actually, in humans, it's called SCG7. And these are two uh, secretogonin uh, uh, genes, uh, which are essentially neuropeptide encoding genes um, of you know, a very large uh, family for which we have very little information about what they uh, do. But it turns out that uh, PV interneurons induce these neuropeptide encoding genes in response to increases in activity. And this is, you know, going from the genetic, you know, from the kind of molecular experiment to, to actual tissue. And what you see here, and again, the nice thing is you can compare even within the same tissue, the infected cells versus the non-infected cells. And as you can see, uh, I don't think you can see my pointer, but, you know, this is RNA for ACE2 and this is for BGF. You can see that the infected cells, you know, get, you know, to express a you know, massive increase in the expression of these two genes. Uh, uh, within hours of, of uh, being activated. Now, to see whether this is actually critical for you know, the changes that we see, the changes in the number of synapses that uh, we see uh, coming from other PV cells, what we did experiments in which we knocked down the expression specifically of these genes, while at the same time we're still activating the activity of uh, PV cells. So we're asking whether any of these genes is actually required for the recruitment of uh, uh, new synapses. And as you can see, this is uh, uh, put together in relative terms. So in control animals, animals when you do uh, activity and, and you use a control uh, knockdown experiment, you see about a 25% increase in the number of inhibitory synapses. Um, when you remove um, uh, SEG2, and even more so when you remove BGF, uh, that increase in synapses is um, absolutely gone. 
So expression of these uh, neuropeptide encoding genes, and, and again, you know, I'm gonna, not going to be able to tell you anything about the molecular mechanisms that mediate these. We can discuss if you are interested. Um, but the expression of these two genes seems to be critical for the remodeling of these inhibitory synapses in a very cell autonomous or specific uh, uh, kind of way. And then the final experiment, because BGF has such a strong experiment, uh, uh, effect on the ability of these cells to get inhibitory inputs from other uh, PB cells, we did a gain of function experiment. So you can uh, maintain the activity the same way, you don't interfere with activity, you overexpress uh, BGF. And what you can see is that BGF overexpression is sufficient to drive to increase the amount of inhibitory synapses that PB cells receive um, uh, in this uh, uh, case. So let me wrap it uh, up uh, here. So what I told you uh, essentially is that you know, PB cells also develop mechanisms to adapt to changes in you know, network conditions and the amount of inputs they receive. And when they receive more uh, drive, when they increase uh, the inputs, uh, that induces a program of activity dependent on gene expression. Our current hypothesis is that you know, this is mediated at least by these two genes, which we think produce um, a peptide that, that we envision is either uh, secreted or presented or uh, something like that, that will do that other PV cells you know, increase the amount of inhibition um, on these cells. Um, mechanistically, because, uh, and this we know, uh, these synapses are quite labeled. Uh, they are very unstable. They modify quite constantly in in vivo experiments. Maybe this system, the only thing that it does is it stabilizes these inhibitory synapses, and then over time you end up with an increased number of inhibitory uh, synapses, but that's something we still need to uh, figure out. So on the second part of, of, of the talk, I'm sorry it took uh, a bit longer than I expected uh, uh, today. Um, um, what, what I told you is that uh, you know, PB cells have developed these mechanisms to um, uh, control their own acceptability, and they do so in a very specific way by recruiting more inhibition from other uh, PB uh, uh, interneurons. And I saw you some evidence suggesting that BGF, this uh, uh, neuropeptide encoding uh, gene, um, it is important for the scaling of, of synapses, even though we don't know what the actual mechanism for this is uh, just yet. And I'll finish here. I'll, 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 I think I mentioned everybody uh, along the way, but the you know, first part is essentially work of uh, Risto and, and Barun, and the second part is mostly work of uh, Martin, I, I did mention Adil Khan, uh, that together with Jasper developed a lot of these uh, uh, behavioral uh, tasks that we have used, and Fursan uh, runs our bioinformatic core, and he has helped a lot with the bioinformatic analysis. And with this, I'll stop. I'll take any questions you may have. Thank you. change of uh, EI balance, um, and you really focused on the change in kind of cell death that happens postnatally. Um, but I guess equally, and also from a disease perspective, that, alter that balance could be changed by a change in the outcome of the progenitors in the MGE, right? Could you comment or could you speculate on, is the effect the same of having fewer interneurons born with it, uh, as, as having uh, more died? Yes, so, so the only the other way that you could adjust final numbers, obviously, changing the proportion of cells that you uh, produce. I don't think that, you know, we have looked at a number of mouse mutants that have, that produce fewer uh, interneurons. Um, but most of the mice that have been generated that way have such a drastic um, effect on interneuron populations. I don't think nobody has taken them through you know, the process of very controlled kind of behavioral experiments in this uh, uh, context. I would imagine that maybe the changes are slightly different because, you know, even though the, the, end, the end up product is the same uh, in terms of like ratios, the timing perhaps is uh, different. In the, in the case of affecting neurogenesis, you will go through a longer period, uh, at least until P5, without those interneurons. Um, Based on what we know, for example, some of the interneurons mature relatively early, and they are quite important for, for example, you know, this kind of phase of very highly synchronized activity that you see in, in you know, at the end of the 
first postnatal week between P5 and P10 or so. So I would imagine that in that particular case, those, that, those things will be disrupted. Um, and that might actually have cascading effects that are different from what I'm showing you here, in which everything is essentially normal until P5. And it's only when you start to, you know, the phase of removing interneurons that you will see um, uh, differences. So because of, of this idea of cascading defects, I would envision that even if the final number of interneurons or ratios are identical, the consequences might not be the same. Right, so, so if you look at the connectivity, obviously PV, PV connectivity is quite favor in the cortex, um, but they actually get inputs from somatostatin and, and uh, BIP cells, so it's not that they, they don't receive inputs from the other population. Um, my interpretation is that they are using PV cells the same way that they, are, that they provide inhibition to pyramidal cells to have very fast, you know, uh, strong control over the excitability of, of that cell population. So to some extent, they are using the same inhibitory motif that targets primarily the soma uh, to control their own uh, activity. So I think it's, the selection is based on that idea, the fact that they can very quickly you know, control the output of, of, the, uh, uh, of the cells, and, and that's why they are uh, co-opted in that uh, way. So myostatin cells will tend to contact all, you know, dendrites and you know they will do more refined uh, things and they might be more important for learning for example um, but they will have less ability to control the output of, uh, of the cell because they target a different compartment. No, it's not. It's not. I, I didn't show any granularity in uh, in this, but no, the changes are quite uh, are quite different. In somatosensory cortex, there is more pyramidal cells, and there is more interneurons, mostly PV and somatostatin interneurons, about thirty percent more. In the prefrontal cortex, there's, there's essentially undetectable changes in the number of excitatory cells, um, but there is many more interneurons. Uh, there is about thirty percent more interneurons, but they are all. Uh, you know, or, or the majority of the excessive uh, um, uh, back of interneurons are somatostatin uh, uh, interneurons. So, so do you think this could be the reason for the difference you see? So I, I didn't see whether you compared for the, for example, the coding part. I, I assume you look also in the somatosensory and the visual cortex, and we didn't see what you saw in the prefrontal cortex. No, we haven't looked at, sorry, at the, uh, at the somatosensory cortex and, uh, and the visual cortex. We're just waiting for uh, reviewers to ask uh, uh, for that. <laughs> I mean, the, these experiments are, are really challenging. Um, um, it takes, you know, altogether about a month because you need to take them first. You need to habituate the animals, take them through the uh, uh, sensory, the whisker-based task, um, and then you move them to the visual uh, task and, and do recordings on them, which means that you cannot run many in parallel because, well, it's, it's just difficult. So we haven't actually done that. And, I mean, there, there are so many uh, things that, that we will need to do to get a better grasp on the story that, uh, yes, we don't know. We don't know the changes are... are um, I mean, my prediction is that you will not see changes in encoding information in V1. Mm -hmm. And that... Uh, you know, maybe you don't also see changes in S1, but, you know, I, I cannot, uh, um, you know, we don't know that because we haven't done those experiments. Uh, that's something that we... Just a final one related to this, because I was also wondering if you only saw the change in encoding when you looked at the visual task following the, some of the sensors, so only the transfer, or did you also look at them separately to see whether... No, we haven't done the, uh, the uh, uh, recordings only in the, uh, uh, on the visual task and whether that's linked to, uh, to that. But, um, yes, so that's something that we could also um, uh, do. We haven't actually looked, you know, the other thing that we haven't done is to take the animals farther 
and then explore whether that differences in encoding goes away when the animal learns or not. So we haven't looked at that either. Yes. Yeah, no, thanks. So um, yeah, very interesting talk. Thanks. Very similar question what Seppel was asking about. Uh, I was very intrigued by this effect that you don't see this, uh, you, don't, you see it built in response to the no go in Newton for plotting the other uh, the data parts. Would you compare the in neurons to the excited results? We see in both. Um, um, but I mean, this is a second process. We only distinguish between you know what what most likely are pyramidal cells and what most likely are fast spiking. Um, the result in the fast spiking is even more dramatic. Um, but you see it in both. Uh, uh, so it's not just uh, a pyramidal cell thing, but you also see it uh, in uh, fast spiking interneurons. Have you tried kind of to rescue it by manipulating? I guess the No, no, we, we haven't, and, and that's, you know, that's a very good, that's a very good point, and essentially because we know what is the population that is changing, we have about 25% increase in somatostatin cells, you could envision an experiment in which you decrease sparsely the activity of somatostatin cells, for example, or inhibit and, and try to rescue um, um, uh, the behavioral uh, outcome. That would be extremely conclusive. I think we did that, uh, which is essentially what, you know, main experiment that the uh, reviewer uh, uh, in our iteration with uh, science uh, uh, required, uh, we would have probably published the manuscript. But uh, again, it's, it's just very difficult. It will take us six months uh, to do the experiment. And I'm not really worried about that, although you know, probably my uh, student and postdoc uh, would be. Um, but I think the chances are that, that that will not do the trick, right? So um, it is one of those experiments that uh, you, you're gambling um, a lot on it. But I agree that that will be an experiment that will be, you know, it will be causally link the alteration that you see with the, uh, uh, with the behavioral um, uh, output. That's why, you know, in, in, in my disclaimer, I wanted to, to essentially say that, you know, what I find interesting at the level of experiments we can do and, and hopefully more people will follow up in different ways is the fact that you know you can alter something quite dramatically um, and two things happen one is that you know that the, that piece of the court is the fighting rates are not changed you know if you look at a lot of people looking at ei balance and you know most people will go and look you know of changes that you know they would expect to have changes in fighting rates and your pyramidal cell will be you know will fight a lot more or your Pyramidal cells will fire a lot less, and you know, at, you know, a lot of the papers looking at, at mutant models of autism and things like that look at it from that perspective. I think that this shows that things are likely a lot more complex, and that uh, the connectivity motifs, the way that the, the circuit is wired, and the amount probably of inhibition that a cell receives, in this case perhaps having too much, uh, too many inputs from some of the cells really change the way that, that those cells encode information. And that, you know, with I don't know how many steps in between, lead to a change in, in, in the behavior. Um, and I find that quite fascinating, the, the fact that it's not, a, you know, it's not just a brutal change in fighting rates and everything is upside down. It's a fairly, it's a bit more subtle than, than that, but yet, you know, you have a fairly uh, strong phenotype at the end of the day. Can I just add? The earliest slide is showed from Alan Hall 4, the heterogeneity of the, the programmed cell here. Yes. It struck me that the, the lowest programmed cell death is D1. Yes. Also M1. And you know, this may be completely wrong, but to what extent is this programmed versus perhaps impoverished input from the early visual system, impoverished motor output? So it, it, it's determined by essential input rather than you know, well, programmed. It's actually, so the way it works uh, is that what is programmed is that the cells will undergo cell death. The interneurons will undergo cell death if left alone. They are programmed to die. That's genetically encoded. And this actually fits quite nicely with people that have been trying to culture GABAergic interneurons from the cortex on their own for years and then will all die, you know, two or three weeks into the culture. You need to put pyramidal cells, you need to put astrocytes, you need to put something there for them to survive. So what is encoded you know, genetically is that the cells are programmed to die unless they are rescued by inputs from pyramidal cells, essentially, downstream or glutamatergic signaling. So indeed, everything that happens in this shaping of 
cell death is related to activity of pyramidal cells and therefore the inputs they receive. Um, to what extent that is sensory driven or spontaneous activity and everything that is related to that, uh, that we need to see because um, in the case of B1, this happens, you know, the program cell that happens before the eye opening, right? It's, it's essentially between B5 and B10. But for the somatosensory cortex, it's happening in a period where obviously the animal is sensing uh, uh, the environment and the amount of, you know, uh, of, uh, we haven't done experiments in that sense, but we have thought about, you know, trying to isolate the, uh, you know, external influence from uh, that cortex. And in the prefrontal cortex, even more so, also because it depends on a lot of inputs coming from other cortical areas that are developing at, uh, um, around that time. Um, but V1 is actually an outlayer. Somehow it's organized in a way that um, I, I never said that it, there's no program cell death because it might be just below the, the noise of what we can detect in our hunting, and we will need maybe 20 animals to see a difference, but it's clearly very small. And from the cellular perspective, B1 is also the outlier of the human visual cortex. So in the human visual cortex, most cortices have a ratio of 3 to 1. Uh, the human visual cortex have a ratio of 6 to 1. So more similar to the mouse than, than any other cortical uh, uh, region. There's a question at the back. Okay. So we, we haven't done anything on, on that regard, but I would imagine that, you know, there are cascading adaptations to any of any sort of problem. I think the brain always finds a way to try to deal with, you know, the changes that you introduce uh, during development. And as I mentioned, you know, when we do these manipulations in which we can alter the cell death of interneurons, we can rescue more or less cells from dying. When you do these manipulations outside the window of the program cell that you no longer change the numbers, but I'm absolutely sure that you will change all the things, that you will change, you know, the amount of uh, synaptic input, you will change probably the expression of receptors. The system will, will find, you know, other mechanisms to compensate for, uh, for those, uh, for those uh, changes. And, you know, in that sense, you know, it's very likely that, you know, if you have, for example, a reduced complement of PV cells, that, you know, that will lead to changes in, um, a receptor expression, for example. So we haven't looked at any of that in in the uh, uh, mouse mutants that we are looking at. That we could do, you know, physiological experiments. We can see um, initial changes in inhibitor inputs, but we haven't looked at you know receptor expression or electro, you know receptor properties uh, or any of that. But I'm pretty sure that there will be such uh, such uh, same changes. even if they're getting you know, more excited or input. This is to say, what's happening to the pyramidal cells? Are the pyramidal cells getting more input? And are the synapses coming from other parvalbumin cells? Are they coming from the other infected parvalbumin cells, or are they coming from the other? So in which way the whole homostasis is controlled in the network? Right, so the first part is it's um, a as, as quick um, um, Answered so they don't change that. So you could record that in you know nearby pyramidal cells, they will not get any change. It's extremely cell specific. Um, so the mechanism is tailored for that interneuron and that interneuron uh, uh, only. And we do have experiments, you know, with the label of the cells. We can know what they, where they're getting inputs, and it's not. It doesn't correlate to other uh, cells. You can get. You, you can see, you know, if you go to the streams of the infection, you can get to places that, that you have just the single one, you know, layer two, three cell with no other cell and a, around, and it will still see the same, uh, the same increase. And I said, you know, I think the mechanism is quite clever because um, uh, 
um, Alvin Nidibi in, in MIT mm -hmm. has done a lot of imaging in vivo. And what you see is that whereas um, uh, PV synapses on pyramidal cells are quite stable, um, PV synapses on other PV synapses are very labeled. They, they, they stabilize for a little bit, and in a couple of hours they retract, they come and go. Uh, so it's, it's like you know, cells are always there somehow you know, making the contest. And I envision this system not as you know, a long-range call in which you, you know, all of a sudden need to attract new inputs, but actually a, a, a system that simply stabilizes these synapses that otherwise are very, are very you know, flexible, so to speak. So over time, you, you achieve this by just stabilizing more and more um, uh, synapses. But um, you know, BGF encodes for, I think, 18 different peptides, uh, SE2, four or five. Uh, so we don't know which one is the active one. We don't know if we know that they are loaded into secretory vesicles, but we don't know if they are secreted. So we're still doing experiments for that. Uh, we don't know the receptor. We don't know anything. Uh, so it will take us a, a, a bit of time. Yeah. Great. I think we have no more questions. So I think I'll stop. Thank you so much. So thank you once again for one. Now go, I think now Jasper, if you create the ball bar one might be close to